Hey, what's up guys? So this is going to be a different type of video. We're going to stray away from my usual style of responding to other people's videos and instead we're going to take a look at some of the comments that were posted on my channel, specifically my most recent climate change video. Now in the past, especially for my flat earth videos, I would get a lot of flat earthers flooding in and downvoting my videos and writing hate comments, but that didn't apply to just my flat earth videos. All my videos always got some degree of hate and I'm used to it. However, recently I've been getting little to no hate comments or any comments that try to go against what I'm saying in my videos. I think that's because all the hate got tired of me or something. What I do find to be interesting though is that any climate change video I put out, I still get a lot of comments trying to argue against what I said in my video. Take my previous climate change video for example. It's gotten a higher ratio of dislikes compared to most of my other recently released videos, so it seems that many, but a small number of people who watch my channel don't believe in man-made climate change. And to me, that seems odd. You believe in science when it tells you, say, creationism is false, or that cyanide can't cure your cancer. But suddenly, when it comes to man-made climate change, you don't accept the science. Okay, I could be wrong and the people writing these comments are people who don't regularly tune into my channel. Either way, I wanted to dedicate this video to that. Time to read some of those comments and respond. Yay! Of course, if you guys want to debate or anything like that, feel free to do so in the comment section below, especially if your comment got addressed here and you want to have a discussion. Alright, let's begin. So to refresh your memory, my climate change video was addressing someone who made two claims in his video. One, he claimed that the CO2 graph should start at zero instead of zooming in to put it into perspective. This is not proper scientific format and is bad at being able to see relationships between the independent independent variables. The second claim he made is that plants are starving for CO2, therefore more CO2 output is good for plant growth. And this idea can be more false due to the fact that plants need more water, nitrogen, and nutrients in order to keep up. If you increase carbon dioxide levels without increasing the other resources, photosynthesis rates will only increase slightly and then plummet downwards. And this is due mostly to the fact that water escapes via transpiration through the stomata on their leaves. I'll leave a link in the description to my original video for those of you who want to get caught up. These comments I will be responding to are addressed to that video, so I think it's a good idea to be familiar with it before watching this one. Or you could, you know, be a rebel and watch this video without any context anyway. Whatever floats your boat. Re, plants and increase CO2. Lack of CO2 is the rate determining growth rate limitation on main plants. This is why greenhouse gases have CO2 pumped into their greenhouses. Earth's plants have had to evolve to live on less and less CO2 as that level has dropped. The increase since the industrial revolution has increased plant yields. To say or imply otherwise is scientifically biased. The fact is, none of the alarmist predictions have come true and yet anyone that observes that is labeled a denier. The true deniers are the ones that continue to believe in climate computer models even though they have failed every predictive test. Okay, so the big flaw I would like to point out here is the beginning of your comment where you claim that CO2 is the rate limiting resource for plants. And you seem to be attempting to back up that conclusion by claiming that CO2 is pumped into greenhouses. Now yes, of course there is much larger concentration of CO2 in a greenhouse, but the problem is everything in a greenhouse is controlled, not just carbon dioxide levels. The plants within the greenhouse are given sufficient amounts of water, nitrogen, and sunlight in order to keep up with photosynthetic levels. It in no way proves that CO2 is the rate limiting step just because there's more CO2 levels, because there is more of every other resource too. By controlling all the supplies at a high level, greenhouses are able to sufficiently increase plant yield. Now in the real world, if CO2 continues to increase, there isn't going to be a larger supply of water and nitrogen to plants all around the world. And like I mentioned in the previous video, without a sufficient amount of water, increased temperatures from the CO2 levels will cause plants to close their stomata for longer periods of time, in order to combat an increased rate of transpiration. Overall, what we will see is that more CO2 will temporarily increase plant yields, but as it keeps increasing, photosynthetic rates will plateau and eventually decline. When that happens, CO2 is not the rate limiting step because it's going to be something else, most likely water. Even if CO2 was the rate limiting resource right now, that doesn't matter. Because what we do know is that it won't be once carbon dioxide levels increase and raise temperatures. Your second claim here is that plant yields have increased since the industrial revolution. And for that I'm going to need a source. See, how exactly do you measure plant yield in this case? Are you using the total amount of plant mass on the earth? Are you measuring mass per unit? Are you getting enough samples from all areas of the earth instead of just the cold ones? It's not that I'm skeptical that data like that exists. I'm sure it does. I I just would like to see it for myself. And I'm more likely to trust a primary source than a secondary one by the way. But even if it has gone up, it still doesn't disprove my point. When CO2 levels increase, plant yield should also increase, but only by a limited amount before it starts to decline as CO2 concentrations continue to rise. As for the last part of your comment, it's difficult to address those claims. If you're going to bring up actual graphs, predictions, or papers that someone published, I'd rather you link it to me so that I can address it directly. If you're going to say the general term, alarmist predictions, there isn't much for me to go off of. Anyone remember the mythical hole in the ozone? After a while we just sorta of stopped talking about it, I wonder why.
Okay, so if you guys aren't familiar with this, I'll give a brief summary. Certain chemicals released from human activity have the ability to damage the ozone layer. These chemicals are called ozone depleting substances and are largely composed of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs for short. Once these are in the air, it can cause an available halogen to chemically react with the ozone, O3, into oxygen gas, O2. The largest effect we've seen is the ozone hole over the Antarctic. People living in Australia are affected by this due to increased sunlight penetration, which increased rates of sunburns and skin cancer. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot Australia doesn't exist. My bad. Anyway, so why have we stopped talking about this? That's simple. This was one of the easier problems to solve and that's exactly what we did. The use of CFCs were significantly reduced at the end of the 20th century due to new laws being enforced, namely the US in 1978, Canada in 1993, and most importantly, the Montreal Protocol in 1989. As a result, the ozone damage slowed down and began to recover in the beginning of the 21st century. It by no means has returned to the level before we began releasing CFCs, but it's a steady recovery rate. People in Australia are still affected by the ozone hole and that will continue to be the case until more time passes. Oh fuck, sorry, I forgot Australia doesn't exist. So now you can see why people stop talking about the ozone hole so much. It's making a recovery and we're not releasing the large amounts of CFCs like we used to. Although the hole is still present, we aren't actively damaging the ozone like we are to the planet by releasing carbon dioxide. The ozone hole is no longer something to be alarmed of, so we stop talking about it. What, would you rather people continue to bitch about it even after we're reversing and fixing the damage? There are more pressing issues to discuss. I don't think climate change slash global warming is anything to worry about. For example, Al Gore uses 21 times more energy than the average American household. If he isn't scared, why should we be? Earth has gone through continuous cycles of hot and cold. Why would it stop now? I'm not saying that the Earth's temperature is changing, just that the effects are blown out of the water to an amazing extent. I think you meant to say, I'm not saying that the Earth's temperature isn't changing. Okay, so the first thing I would like to say is, I don't give two shits about Al Gore and neither should you. He's a politician, not a scientist. He in absolutely no way represents the scientific community. I'm extremely tired of people bringing up Al Gore. The man is irrelevant and we should stop mentioning his name. Once again, I have to point out there's a difference between the claims of science popularizers and the claims of scientists. Instead of nitpicking everything about what Al Gore claimed or even how he lives his life, it's more productive to read actual scientific papers. I better not see Al Gore being mentioned at all in the comment section, guys. I'll fucking rip you a new one. Anyway, to address your second claim, yes, the earth has gone through hot and cold in the past. The climate varied greatly. However, there's a key difference, and this is something I mentioned multiple times in previous videos. It's the rate of change that matters the most. When the climate changes, so do ecosystems. If ecosystems change too fast, living organisms can't adapt. And this is a claim that evolutionary theory implies. When the environment changes, population will change to adapt. However, if the environment changes too quickly, the intense evolutionary pressure will end up killing off species and populations. This applies to both plants and animals, and you can quickly see how this can be a chain reaction, especially if a few species are crucial in the role they play in food chains. Climate change will alter many things, from higher temperatures to more intense storms, from rising sea levels to ocean acidification and these are all rapidly affecting the niches of living organisms, including humans. Nature adapts, but not that quickly. The rate in which CO2 and temperatures are increasing is many times higher than anything in Earth's history, and that's what makes the difference. Sure, I don't have a problem with the y-axis not starting at zero. I'm with you on that one. The problems start with you talking about global greening. You're claiming plants will have a reduced water use efficiency? One of the major points why plants grow better with more CO2 is an increase in water use efficiency. The stomata have to be open for a shorter amount of time to take in the same amount of CO2. This increased efficiency has made it so dry areas have shown the biggest increase in plant biomass. I'm having none of this desertification because global warming lie. It's the opposite. As for nitrogen, nitrogen fixating bacteria often are in symbiosis with plants. More plants equals more roots equals more more nitrogen fixating bacteria equals more nitrogen availability. As for this small increase, if you call a 25% greener planet due to the added CO2 small, then I don't know what you call big. Okay, so you made two points I would like to debunk. Let's start with their claim that more CO2 would allow more water use efficiency because their stomata need to be open for shorter periods of time. That claim couldn't be more false. The rate of diffusion is proportional to the CO2 concentration, yes, but the increased rate of water transpiration is many many times higher than the increased diffusion rate of CO2. In other words, the higher temperature will serve to increase transpiration faster than the higher CO2 concentration can increase CO2 absorption. Yes, plants will get more carbon dioxide for the same amount of time they keep their stomata open, but the amount of water they lose will cause them to keep them closed for longer, and this will make them absorb less carbon dioxide overall. I don't mean to offend by saying this, but taking a college level plant ecology class to learn more about this in depth could be beneficial. In the class I took, we had an entire unit dedicated to the science behind this. Plants that live in drier environments, let's say the cactus, have evolved better mechanisms to trap water. For example, the presence of wax, or the fact 
fact that they're cam plants. I won't go through the exact biochemical processes of cam plants, but basically they primarily open up their stomata during the night, which is cooler and thus less water is transpired, and then store the CO2 until the day, which they then use for photosynthesis. Regular plants don't do this because they don't have sunlight to feel the light-dependent reactions, so during the night they undergo metabolism. That is, they utilize oxygen and release CO2, and when this exchange happens, they still have to keep their stomata open, but that's besides the point. This extra mechanism that cam plants have allow them to capture CO2 without losing too much water. C4 plants are kind of the same. They utilize pep carboxylase instead of rubisco like what C3 plants use in order to capture CO2 more efficiently, and thus allow them to open their stomata for shorter periods of time. C4 and cam plants will be relatively resistant to the increased temperatures from global warming. But guess which plants would be screwed? That's right, C3 plants, which make up 95% of all the plants on Earth. They don't have a mechanism that allows them to survive in higher levels of heat like C4 and cam plants do. So in other words, 95% of plants will suffer from our increased output of CO2. If the data you mentioned is true and that plants that live in dry environments are thriving better, then that's why. Because these plants, CAM and C4 plants, have mechanisms that allow them to more efficiently capture carbon dioxide without losing too much water. Regular plants don't have such a thing, so they will end up decreasing their output and eventually just die. Now let's talk about your claim on nitrogen. Yes, the primary method in which plants can obtain nitrogen is through nitrogen fixing bacteria. N2 is not relatively reactive and plants can't use it directly, so they depend on certain bacteria to change it into ammonia. There are two points I must make here. First of all, your conclusion requires the premise that plants will have more growth due to global warming. While yes, more plant root mass could increase the presence of these bacteria, I've demonstrated earlier that growth simply is not the case for 95% of plants on Earth when CO2 rises. Second of all, not all plants form symbiotic relationships with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. In fact, it is mostly legumes with a few exceptions that form nodules in which these bacteria can reside in. Why do you think that gardeners must place a few legumes around near other plants or rotate between legumes and non-legumes on a patch of soil? It's for optimal growth because these legumes can provide a proper nitrogen source to those who otherwise don't form symbiotic relationships with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Non-legumes have to absorb whatever ammonia is in the soil, which is still provided by fixing bacteria, but just don't have that symbiotic relationship that legumes do. These plants won't have an increased source of nitrogen and thus will still be lacking in that resource. Unless you're willing to go around and fertilize all the plants in the world, nitrogen will be a limiting resource for plants trying to survive in a warming planet. Anyway, that's quite enough for today. I was hoping to get to more comments, but I'm already exhausted. Maybe I'll make a part two, perhaps if you guys want to hear more about the mechanisms of C4 and camp plants. Massive shout out to Fireshard and Daniel Seibel for being the top patrons. I'll see you guys next week.